Well, good morning. So this morning we're going to go through uh, the miracle uh, that of uh, Jesus healing Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law. This uh, this miracle is recounted in three places uh, in Scripture for us. Matthew chapter eight. Um, Mark chapter 1, and then uh, Luke chapter 4. It's a a brief couple of verses. I think Matthew and Mark, it's covered in two verses, and Luke extends it out to three verses. But like so many things in Scripture, although it's just a few short words, uh, it's very rich in meaning uh, and nuance. So uh, some of the things that we know about it, one of the things that we know or we suspect is that it took place in or very near Capernaum. We don't know with absolute certainty where exactly it took place. We know that uh, it does say that Jesus went to Capernaum, um, but there's a question about Uh, among scholars, I guess, uh, about exactly where this healing took place, about where exactly Peter did live. So there's a map. You can see right up here, the Sea of Galilee, right there, is Capernaum. On the northwest tip of the Sea of Galilee. We've got the, uh, the Jordan comes down there. And then you'll see over here is Bethsaida. So there's a question about whether that is the Bethsaida that uh, it says Peter lived in. Uh, there's also some research has done. Uh, that's about three miles from Capernaum to the Bethsaida there. Some uh, research that was done that says that three miles the other way, approximately, there was another Bethsaida. And then there's speculation that the Bethsaida that Peter lived in was actually a small suburb of Capernaum. I think uh, if we look at, we can look at scripture and find, you know, and speculate which one of these is actually correct. Um, I'm inclined to think that it's a a sort of a suburb of Capernaum, myself, um, because of the law. And uh, here's just a different picture of it. It gives you uh, uh, an appreciation for some of the plains and the mountains that were in that area. Uh, Again, you see Capernaum near the tip and then you can see, heading northwest, the, the plain of Gesenera, which is right here. And then you see some mountains, mountainous area. And then uh, here's one last picture. This gives you an idea, an appreciation. This is looking from approximately where Capernaum is. Towards the, towards the southwest and over the plain of Gethsemane and then you see the mountains off in the distance. So it's a beautiful area. John 1 and verse 44 tells us that uh, Philip arrived in uh, Philip of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Andrew, of course, was Peter's brother. Uh, We can also see from the scripture that Andrew lived in Peter's household. And it tells us here that Peter was in Bethsaida. Now, a question of whether uh, Peter moved or the Bethsaida mentioned here is that, you know, the speculation that that was a suburb of Capernaum. Uh, We don't really know for sure. Um, We know that... uh, 
this healing takes place, or excuse me, this miracle takes place on the Sabbath day. Um, Christ knew the scriptures, of course. Um, he was very knowledgeable about them. He had access to them. Uh, this scene is him leaving the synagogue on the, on the Sabbath day. Uh, and the law, as you can see from Exodus 16, verse 29, the law put restrictions on travel on the Sabbath day. Christ understood the law. He understood the prin underlying principle of it, not just the letter of the law. And uh, he was not one of those people who would fill a jar with dirt from his home and then carry that with him a great distance so that he could go and visit his friends. He understood the principle was that people would stay home on the Sabbath. They would, they would uh, remember God. They would think about what they had done. They would think about their service to God. And they wouldn't fill their time with other things that distracted them from resting from the work of man and considering their work for God. So Exodus 16 and 29, See that for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. So they didn't even have to find food on the, on the Sabbath day. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Stay home. So, for this reason, I think it, it was he was very close to Capernaum. He would not have uh, he would not have gone to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and then traveled three miles one way or three miles the other way. He was very close. And the restriction, the restriction is, uh, it's not in here, but it's, it does limit travel to basically the distance that one would travel from their home to the synagogue. So, not terribly far. So we look at a scene here in which uh, Jesus enters Peter's home. He's traveling again from the synagogue. He has two disciples with him, James and John. Um, it's easy to imagine after he had spent some time teaching and preaching that some others from the synagogue may have traveled along with him. Uh, uh, I imagine any one of us who had the benefit of hearing Christ uh, share some of his wisdom and some of his teachings probably would have followed along with him at that point. But only James and John are mentioned. Uh, so they come into Peter's home, and it's then that he's told of this woman's condition. Uh, medicine being was what it was at that time, uh, a fever was something to be very, very concerned about. Uh, it's not clear from the text what sickness she had, only that she had a great fever. Uh, Luke, in fact, refers to it as a great fever, so it must have been very high fever, debil debilitating. She may have been in bed for several days, uh, most likely on the verge of death. Uh, each author refers to this fever. They use the same word, uh, fiery heat. Uh, and you can, say it, you can see it appears six times from the Strong's word. So we can be confident from this that uh, her condition was much concern to all in the household, all around her. So probably it was an incredible relief when Christ walked through the door. Uh, I imagine that they know they knew that he was coming. Uh, the Sabbath day being what it was, they they uh, you know the priority was to go to the synagogue, and which he did. So those waiting behind. Uh, must have been very relieved. It's not clear even how long they had been waiting, if it had been a few days. Uh, but they were very happy and they were very excited when he arrived and it was very urgent. You can tell from the text that it was very urgent when he walked in the door that they immediately addressed this issue and asked for his assistance. So Christ approaches her bedside 
and takes her hand and heals her. It says the fever left her immediately, and immediately this woman, who only moments before was very near death, she arose and she ministered unto Christ. She served them. She went about her normal duties. So, if she was on the verge of death, if she was in such horrible condition, why would she not need time to recover? Certainly we've all been sick, probably had a very high fever when we were younger. Understand the condition that you're in. You may spend most of your time sleeping, may, may reach the point where you're delirious. Certainly you're, when you have a high fever like that, you're not you're not of full mind. You don't fully understand what's happening around you. Uh, and then you need time to get over it. It's not an instantaneous thing, as we read here. So why would she not need that time to recover? Why would she immediately arise and begin serving others? Well, this was not, this was not a body healing itself. This wasn't something her body did. It did not overcome the sickness that was within her. It wasn't the, with the assistance of any medicines uh, derived by man's work. Nobody gave her anything that uh, caused her to be healed. This was a miracle done by Christ. He approached her bedside. He touched her hand. She sat up and she was absolutely fine. The nature of Christ's action, uh, which was a power, of course, given to him by God, allowed this instant healing. Her body, now in a completely healthy state, with no need of recovery, she was fine and ready to get back to her duties, which on this day included ministering unto this remarkable man who had entered her household and saved her life. So, she must have recognized the significance of what had happened. Uh, she was Peter's mother-in-law, so she lived in his household. She knew who Jesus was. She had met him before. Of course, everyone at that time knew who Christ was. We read in Luke 4 and 37, uh, the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. So all knew him. Had this woman not believed, had she lacked the faith that what she had previously seen and heard regarding Jesus Christ was not true, it's hard to say whether this miracle would have occurred. She was near death, and Christ our Savior saved her with a simple touch of his hand. With that touch, she was transformed from certain death unto life. And if we look at Matthew 8 and 15, he uses a Greek word that means to fasten oneself to, adhere to. So her faith made it possible for Christ, through that touch of her hand, to fasten himself to her. So from that point on, this incident would be part of her, a testimony she could share with all who would listen of how Christ had arrived at her bedside and rescued her from probable death. We can tell the same stories, the same type of story, I think, brothers and sisters. We, we all have sought Yahweh, um, whether it's through living in a Christadelphian household, uh, growing up there, um, attending a lecture or a seminar and coming into the truth, 
We became knowledgeable about what God's about God's ways and how Christ put his knowledge into action. And we were all inspired to follow his example. Each of us were obedient and submitted to baptism. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I taught CYC, and one of the things that, well, what we went through that week was uh, the commandments of Christ. And I came, in, in preparing for it, I came across a, a short uh, exposition that a brother had written on, on the, uh, the three different classifications of people. The first one was those who are knowledgeable about God and what he asks of us, what he instructs us to do. But that's a classification of people who have not submitted to baptism. And then they, they live a life that conflicts with uh, what God asks us of us. The second classification was a group of people who were also knowledgeable about God's teachings and his requirements. They had submitted to baptism, but like the first group, they led a life that did not adhere to what God had asked of us. And then there was the fourth group, excuse me, the third group that, um, that we all strive to be in, which is those who are knowledgeable of God, those who have submitted to baptism, and uh, live a life according to scriptural teachings, according to what Christ had done, what God has asked of us. So it's easy to it's easy to slip back and forth. We don't know which of those. Uh, of course, after baptism, we all were either in the second or third classification. Um, but we don't know until Judgment Day whether we are in that second group who have not met God's expectations or in the third group, which have. So that's sort of the challenge for us every day, isn't it? Is uh, to look at what Christ did and to examine ourselves. That's one of the reasons we come here on Sunday, is to examine ourselves and determine have we been conducting ourselves appropriately? Would God be pleased with what we have said and thought and done? So most of us in this room were obedient and had submitted to baptism. So at some point in that process, Christ fastened himself to us, just as he did to this woman. Uh, he became part of the story of our lives. We were rescued from certain death, just like Peter's mother-in-law. But now we exist in a state of potential eternal life. We strive to be in that third group who will be given eternal life. I'm sure we all fear that we're in the second group who will be rejected. What this woman did after was, I can imagine it was a way of being thankful for what Christ did. She arose and she ministered unto Christ and his disciples by serving them, by serving God. She went right back to work. Something we should, you know, consider and, and do our best to follow her example each day. So, with that, that is, that's the end of my narrative. Uh, I thought it would be good to go through, I have some notes on, on the three readings, uh, and go through those and we can talk about what some of the specific word mean, words mean, what some of the phrases and where some of the information comes from. So if you'd all turn to Matthew 8...
the the miracle takes place in verses 14 and 15. But if we look at verse 5 very quickly, we can see that Jesus entered into Capernaum. The record then goes on to recount the story of the centurion. Um, Each of these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looks at Christ in this different way. Um, This is not in sequence. It's in the correct sequence. Luke, Luke is more chronologically accurate. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate, um, but if you're looking for the chronology you go to, of the events, you look to Luke. Matthew is recounting a number of miracles done by Christ, and he groups them together in that way. So Jesus didn't enter into Capernaum, uh, then go and heal the centurion's servant, and then go to the synagogue. In Luke, that actually happens in chapter 7. Um, he did enter Capernaum, go to the synagogue, and then go to Peter's house. So this, it's, not, it's not in the direct, correct order in that, but we do know where he was. So uh, going to verse 14... And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of fever. This is a different word than the fever that I had on the overhead. This is not the fiery heat. This is nothing more than to be sick of a fever. It's not a... uh, It's not the descriptive word, that fiery heat that appears later on. In verse 15, we see he touched her hand. And that's the fastened oneself to, where he fastened himself unto her. And the fever left her. She arose and ministered unto them. And there arose there is the Greek word agerio, which means, uh, and it appears many times, um, means to rise, arise, rise up, rise again, to arouse, cause to rise. So as if out of a sleep. So it appears that she what it's suffering from some level of delirium. She was not clear. Uh, she was not of clear mind. In one case, that word is actually used cause to be born. The word ministered that we see there is daikonio. It's a Greek 12 excuse me, the Strong's 1247, uh, and it means to be a servant, an attendant, a domestic. So she rose up and went right back to work serving them, serving Christ and the disciples. Uh, If we turn to Mark chapter 1, We look at verse 29, is where we see uh, Christ arriving. If we look back at verse 21, though, we can see that they went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. So looking at verse 29, and forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, 
they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew. We see that Andrew lived with Simon. Simon, of course, was Peter. Simon was excuse me. Simon Peter was married. Uh, Andrew probably was not, just living with his brother. And here we see that Christ arrives with James and John. In verse 30, we see Simon's wife, wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. Looking at that word anon, it, uh, it's a translation of the word immediately, straight away, forthwith. So each, each different way that word is used, it has that sense of immediacy. There's no delay associated with it. Straight away, forthwith, right away, it was done. So immediately, they told him of her. They rushed it gives you almost a sense of that they rushed to him as soon as the door opened. In verse 31, we see uh, Christ came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. It almost creates an image like someone being baptized, doesn't it? We're immersed. And you sit up afterwards. And it's a very similar word. Um, it's used, it's translated to arouse, cause to rise, to arouse from sleep, to awaken. So immediately he awakened her. He lifted her up. Um, and immediately the fever left her. We looked at the word anon in verse 30. In verse 31, the word immediately is the same Greek word. And immediately the fever left her, it said, and she ministered unto them. And the word, the translated word left, the original Greek is actually to send away. So to me, it's, it really changes that left as it's sort of, it's gone. But the Greek word, send away, it, it paints a picture of Christ. He forced it out. He touched her hand, forced that sickness out of her. And again, he, she ministered unto them. We've talked about that before. Any questions or comments before we move on to the last portion about either Matthew or Mark? Yes, Bob. We find in all these miracles that they're direct and complete. Because often we find that we're in the immediate. No lingering or lasting effects. That's, that's one observation I have found. The second here is with the, the fever. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's an English translation, I know, but it says sick of a fever rather than sick with a fever. So it may not be sort of like a flu type thing when you get, when you can be febrile. But to me, it, it brings to mind. Uh, High fevers, such as would cause maybe seizures, because we know the very young and the very old are more susceptible than kind of generally middle aged people are to fevers and, and uh, seizure activity. Right. It may have been, you know, sort of that in that line. It's hard to tell because it's only good. Anyway. Right, right. Anything else? All right, let's turn to Luke. It's chapter 4. Verses 38 and... Let's see, 
Um, before we get into that, we can look at verse 31 and we can see, and came, Christ came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Verse uh, 38, and he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great, great fever, and they besought him for her. So this is where it really very effectively paints a picture of Christ walking in the door of Peter's house, and they besought him for her. Um, the original Greek word really is more of a uh, pray or to beg them. So the door opens and they rush to the door begging Christ to come and help this poor woman. If we look at verse 39... Again, Christ stood over her and rebuked the fever. Rebu rebuked in the Greek is more accurately translated straightly charged. To rebuke, reprove, to admonish. So, he rebuked the fever. He he must have uttered something. Uh, it indicates that he didn't simply take her hand. He, he uttered some words, and the fever was forced out of her, and she was healed. You know, I read these, and when I, was, when I first read it, and I was thinking about how, how this woman could have simply risen up, I thought of uh, all those who were lame, uh, the, the people that Christ healed who were lame from death, they couldn't walk from, uh, lame from the time they were born, they couldn't walk. The, the man who was blind from the time he was born. And their bodies had no, no ability to, to operate before that, and Christ healed them, and the man immediately gets up and starts walking, casts away his, his uh, cushion, I think is the word. Uh, so it makes sense, you know, in that context, it makes sense that certainly he could have healed her and immediately she was fine. So looking again at verse uh, 39, uh, and immediately she arose. There's that word again, forthwith, straight away, and ministered unto them. So we see that she, she got up and she gave thanks by getting back to work and serving God. Mm -hmm.